Well, it's a beautiful October day. We've passed the equinox and we're into autumn fishing proper now. September seems like a distant memory and the summer seems like a distant memory as well. And with that radical change in the season, the behaviour in the carp will change radically as well. I've, I should just point out, I've just been in the lake with a fish, so I haven't suddenly developed incontinence. Although it's probably not far off. But um, So autumn fishing. Now, as we did with the rest of the series, we're addressing each quadrant of the seasons and looking at the typical challenges that the angler is faced with during that phase. Things to expect, things that we can't expect, always unex expect the unexpected, um, obstacles that we will have to overcome, and um, generally aiming to get your grey matter ticking over with ways that you can maybe improve your autumn fishing. Now, autumn fishing is, is very, uh, it's changed so much in the last it seems to have changed a lot in the last few years, but it's certainly changed a lot in the last 20 or so years. And what we've got <clears throat> is a perfect storm of intense angling pressure, which is obviously the byproduct of loads and loads of anglers on the bank. And when you get fish that are under sustained pressure and being exposed to lots of bait and getting caught a lot, uh, by the time you get to the back end of the year, they can be quite battle weary. And I now think that for various reasons, which we'll get into in a minute, the autumn period is the hardest part of the whole calendar now. I think on a lot of lakes you can go and find that the winters are a more realistic proposition, purely by virtue of the fact that in the winter, the banks are quieter, so there is less pressure. The fish will be more settled as a result and if you find them they can be quite catchable whereas in the autumn that's definitely not the case and that's quite a statement to make you know to you know in in the last couple of decades i've seen a steady decline in autumn fishing on 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 venues that see a lot of pressure that's key now if you again winding the clock back a bit the, the autumn harvest, the harvest moon, the autumn bounty, you know, that whole thing that carp fishing to a greater extent is built on, you know, the autumn phase when the fish are at their biggest weights and, you know, they need to eat lots to get them through the winter and so on. Well, that just doesn't seem to happen anymore for various reasons, um, again, which we'll get into. But certainly 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, you look back through carp fishing history even from Walker's record uh, in 1952, you know, the autumn was considered the key phase, notwithstanding the fact that when you went back sort of pre mid 90s, there was no close season. So you, you were eliminating the spring for starters. So you had the summer and the autumn and the winters weren't much cop. They were a lot harsher than we get these days, people's equipment, you know. So I guess when you look back, there were two key seasons, summer, and the autumn and in in decades gone by the autumn was always considered to be the very best time and, and that sort of filtered down through through the ages it's become part, part of our it's become almost institutionalized it's part of our carp fishing psychological heritage that the autumn is the time get on the bank in the autumn not just because there's no mosquitoes which is bloody marvelous but that's when the carp are going to be at their biggest but unlike decades gone by it's not now when the carp are at their most catchable and if you're lucky enough to have access to a venue that doesn't get any angling pressure or gets very little angling pressure then the autumns can still be really key can still be really good but when you look at lakes which get a lot of bait a lot of angler footfall and consequently usually quite a lot of captures, the autumns are absolutely granite hard these days. And it's something that I've come to learn the hard way, but I've seen it on a lot of hard circuit waters, whether it was the quarry when it was day ticket or 
Sandhurst, you know, fantastic waters, and I've seen them really, really punish predictable angling in the autumn phase. And as you probably gathered, I'm not big on predictable angling at any time, but do it in the autumn at your folly, because by the time we get to this stage, the carp have been under sustained angling pressure from March, certainly from April. That's a long time. On a lot of lakes, the amount of bait that has gone into the water column will be astronomical, which the byproduct of is that fish don't need, most years don't need to suddenly reclaim all their lost weight through spawning to get them through winter. On most lakes, the fish are, most years they're not doing a proper clear out. Actually, a few, this year was a very, very good spawning year. You saw fish drop a lot of weight, but again, they put it back on very, very quickly, much more quickly than they used to because of their exposure to big volumes of invariably good quality bait. So in days gone by where there wasn't much bait going in and the fish dropped their spawn in the summer and they're trying to build it back up through the natural food in the water and maybe a little bit of limited bait availability, you would get to a stage in October where or maybe November, depending on the weather. Usually October actually in, in decades gone by because November was even the time where you get lids on lakes in, in November. It doesn't happen anymore these days, but again, that's a, a gradual um, seasonal shift in weather trends that, that we've seen. Now we get warmer autumns, wetter autumns, and usually milder winters, but much, much colder springs. That's something that I've seen in the last few decades, very, very noticeable change. I don't think it's global warming or anything like that. I think it's just going through a cyclical meet meteorological changes and adjustments that the planet's done for since it's been in existence. So <clears throat> there are a few helicopters whizzing about over here today, so you might hear a couple of those. You feel like you're out in the middle of the nowhere, which we are out in the Northamptonshire countryside, but um, it seems to be a favourite little place for flight paths. We had a couple of Spitfires and a Hurricane and a Messerschmitt doing loop the loop last week, which was fun, but um, made working hard with the cameras. But anyway, so the thing with bait and carp exposure to captures is that carp fishing in 2021 is very, very ruthlessly honed to precision. Think about the edges that we've now got at our disposal. Wrapping sticks, hook sharpening, access to phenomenal quality bait. There's very few secrets left in carp fishing. Everyone's got access to rigs that set up correctly won't tangle. People are more switched on now how to find carp. So the level of carp fishing know-how and application has gone up more than tenfold. It's gone up enormous, exponentially almost. You know, There's been a very sharp rise in carp angling talent over the last 20 years. Um, certainly the last 10. Uh, and the byproduct of that, not just the anglers improving because of all the, the coaching you can get or the YouTube videos or the books, is so much information. But with the technical edges that I mentioned as well, you put all that together and carp fishing is, is at times a ruthlessly effective machine. Now, that means that <clears throat> most of the time you will catch more carp collectively more carp will get caught but the byproduct of catching loads of carp ultimately is catching less carp because the more carp you catch the harder they become to catch so unless you stay ahead of the curve and take measures um, to counteract any drop off or decline in in your catches then things can very, very quickly start to, to go wrong. So with carp getting caught more and more often, you then have to factor in the, the fact that no carp will allow itself to get caught in perpetuity. If you think about the carp that you know that you've seen, usually you can box off certain carp with coming out a certain number of times a year. Might be a once a year fish, might be a once every two year fish, could be a five times a year fish. But very often those 
guidelines for, for, for numbers of captures and even the times of year that those captures will take place stand true. And it, it, it sort of means that now carp fishing has got more and more effective. Fish that were maybe a three times a year carp that might do a capture in the spring, one in the summer and one in the autumn, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, now because of the ruthlessly, ruthless effectiveness of the carp angling machine, those captures might all be accounted for by the beginning of June. Caught three times, game over, and maybe you'll squeeze out another capture, but maybe not. So what, what I'm getting at is that the threshold for the number of bites an individual fish is gonna do is reached earlier these days than it used to be. And sooner that as that threshold is reached, obviously the carp get harder and harder and harder to catch because they don't like getting caught and they will do everything they can to avoid having those silly moments where they do slip up. So when you come into the autumn, you've, you've, you've got fish that have probably, may well have done their quote, quotient of captures for the year, have been under heavy sustained pressure on a lot of lakes and have been able to eat as much as they want. Very often, um, this year was an exceptional one, exceptional one, as I said, for spawning all around the country, but very often fish are back up to the weight they need to be to get through the winter months by September. Uh, they don't need that huge amount of, of excess body fat or anything, you know. The, the, now I think it is a myth that they have to carry on munching and getting bigger and ballooning right up, you know. By the time it gets to September on most lakes, fish are at a comfortable weight that they need to be at. So that kind of rules out that crazy big October, November feed up. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing that less and less and less these days. Now, when you look around nature at this time of year, <clears throat> you will see that nature has laid on a banquet for all, all, um, all of the, the huge variety of, of wildlife to feed on outside the lake. So you see berries, you'll see acorns, you'll see apples, all sorts of stuff, autumn fruits. And as I said, that's laid on so that nature can help all the animals get through the winter months. But the same is going on underneath the surface of the lake. A lot of people, I think, tend to think that fly hatches and the naturals and everything is in fast diminishment by the time it gets to this time of year. And it's my belief that actually the opposite is true. It's the same under the surface of the lake as it is hanging on all the trees and uh, being available for, for everything to, to feast on. So you're faced with carp that have been caught a lot. Even if they haven't been caught a lot, they've been exposed to a lot of pressure. They've had as much as they need in terms of food. There's so much bait going in. They've replaced their spawning weight by September. And you've got a profusion of natural food that's been laid on by mother nature coinciding at the same time to make the perfect storm. So the fish don't need to eat bait, A because they're already at a good healthy weight to get through winter, but B because now there is this huge surplus of natural food as well. They're very, very wary because they may have done their quotient of captures. And believe you me, they know the game. Now on lake, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have access to a lake that doesn't really see much angling pressure it's different and on lakes like that I think you can still expect good autumn feed ups if they've not seen loads of pressure and they've not been exposed to lots and lots of bait and usually on those sort of lakes they're very very good winter waters as well again if the fish haven't been hammered and caught throughout the year they could be more willing to give themselves up to a risk in January or February and that's another reason why now the winters are so hard. It's a knock-on effect from uh, concentrated, hardcore exposure to pressure through the spring and the summer months that you get this tail off. It's, it's going to happen. So <clears throat> what we need to look at is how we can mitigate that tail off, that decline in results to try and keep things in our favour. And to stay ahead of the curve with those things, there are several areas that we need to consider. Um, and these would include bait and types of bait, 
they would include location because that's very unpredictable at times but I would say strangely it's becoming more predictable which um, we're going to get onto in a moment and also the fact that carp at this time of year become very very nocturnal certainly on days like today on most big fish waters you'll be lucky to see a carp all day even first light isn't really a great time to find carp even though for the preceding months throughout the angling calendar it's all about first light you, the earlier you get there the more you're going to see um, now in fact we'll go there first while we're talking about it so now <clears throat> If you get to the lake in the autumn, October, November, very rarely will you see the fish very active in the mornings. Totally different to the summer months and, and indeed some of the spring months. The reason I think for that is because there has been a, a concerted change to nocturnal biased activity by the carp. And this applies to, I think, every water, very few rules there are very few rules in carp fishing but i would say this is as close to being one i would say as i think every water that i can think of that i fished currently or in the last few years switches to nocturnal activity about when you get the equinox and and pretty much stays that way until march very often uh, and then you get that tick over into daytime activity in the spring <coughs> Now, because the carp tend to be more active at night, it means that we need to be on our game. Now, if we turn up at a lake at first light and there's nothing showing, we could be waiting until dusk or into the evening until we get an idea where those carp are, which could mean treading water for a whole day. Um, <clears throat> it might be that you only have the day. Um, so arrival times need to be thought about now i would be certainly through october to march i would be far more interested in getting to a lake late afternoon even early early evening than i would at first light first light does still have value you know if you there's a lot of times you can turn up if there's been no wind you can turn up at dawn and locate the cart by viewing those thick thick frothy sets of bubbles that you see hanging in the surface film and you get those a lot in the autumn I don't know whether it's because the, the viscosity of the water is changing the surface viscosity because it's getting colder and I don't know but <clears throat> you certainly see it a lot more in the autumn and that is one of the the signs that will show you clearly where the fish have been cavorting during the night rolling and obviously fizzing but a fish breaching and going back in will leave a thick frothy set of bubbles on a, a still autumn night and if you turn up at first light you know over the years quite often I've been faced with areas in corners or bays or wherever where there is just a focused area of thick froth, frothy sets of bubbles sure fire giveaway that that's where it was kicking off during the night that's where the party was if the thick bubbles are in lines of, it's of less interest because they're usually caused by coots fighting taking off and running along the water and they'll leave these lines of bubbles but if they're in patches and clusters it's nailed on carp behavior now ideally i'd be looking to arrive for sundown and into the evening again it's a slight generalization but a good rule of thumb well not rule of thumb i, I would say observations would suggest just about every lake I can think of that I fished in the last God knows how long, this time of year, the evening, is the time that the carp will show the most. Could be just into dark, could be eight, nine, ten o'clock in the evening, but most lakes they will show in the evening, in the autumn. And indeed the winter, but obviously generally activity is, is, is slowing down by then. But finding carp in the autumn, in the, in the early part of the evening, maybe up to midnight, is very very a very effective way to start your trip and work out where the carp are now i can think back to when i was young dumb and full of comers i think the phrase the phrase is but when i used to i didn't quite get it and i used to be obsessed with 
getting in a swim and getting everything sorted in daylight because I could see visually that it was pinpoint perfect and it was bang on. And, and I used to get really stressed that I had to get it done before dark. Now, I would say my mindset is the complete and exact opposite. I'm wanting dark to envelop me and I, I want to go hunting in the dark. I want to walk around and now I would say a great bit, of, you know, if you can get down to the lake in the evening, at eight o'clock in the evening and start your session then, you probably, on a lot of lakes, you will be able to find the carp. And if it's midweek, you'll probably be able to get on them as well. I think that whole location thing, once you get your head around it, it's why, why would you want to be setting up perfectly with pinpoint precision in the daylight where you might not have seen a carp compared to casting out in the dark where there's 50 carp rolling about you know it's a it's a no-brainer and being prepared or or um, having the mindset that yeah i'm going to cast out in the dark it's not a problem once you reach that it becomes a potent weapon in itself in fact i had a very lucrative winter last year and the winter in fact the last few winters have been good ones uh, and certainly last winter i can say hand on heart that every single carp that I caught big or small came on a cast that was done in the dark so you know that, that that's that's quite telling I think what one, one thing I would mention is obviously how your rig enters into the water is really really important and watching the rig go through the air and then stopping the cast just before it hits the water so it goes in lovely and it's not tangled and it's fully extended is is uh, precluded because of obviously because of the darkness so what I tend to do if it's up to th 40 yards or so sometimes I, I can do it by judgment pretty well but usually I'll, if I find fish I, I will then posit the question in my own mind how far out are those carp it might be that I'll say 80 yards for example okay so I've, st I've stood there and I'm listening to carp. And I think they're about 80 yards out. Might even be able to see the odd slosh in the moonlight. And then I'll wrap out three rods, one at 19, one at 20, one at 21. Send them out to the clips, feel them down to the bottom. And um, that just seems to work pretty much everywhere. The only time I think that probably wouldn't work is if you literally had top to bottom weed and you couldn't get a drop then it gets a little bit more complicated. But on it, even on very weedy lakes, the weed is dropping down low now and fishing in it is something that you shouldn't be afraid of doing. You know, if you can protect the hook with a little bag or a bit of foam or whatever and a long hook link, um, casting out and getting a soft drop when I'm casting to show and fish doesn't phase me at all and it's caught me a lot of fish over the years. So being on your toes for nocturnal activity is absolutely key and very 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 effective and the people who want it more will catch the most and if you a lot of people you know i know real life means overnighters you know during the week when people are working the next morning and so on and that can be <coughs> perhaps a bit soul destroying you always feel like you're packing up at the wrong time and so on but actually in the autumn the activity is mostly at night you can get down after work in the dark, five, six in the evening. Don't be rushed, don't be stressed. Walk around the lake, hear where they're rolling. And at some point in the evening on just about every lake, a carp or two or sometimes loads will give themselves away. Getting yourself in the area. And, you know, usually by the next morning, seven o'clock or so, it's done and dusted anyway. You, you know, as the sun comes up and gets brighter and brighter, bite time is fast diminishing. So. If you are someone that can only do overnight as work nights, then, or fashionably quick overnight as then, it's a good time of year to do it because your rods are all out through that good key bite time. After pressure, angling pressure, weather, and sometimes before it actually, weather obviously plays a very, very significant part in the daily life of the carp and indeed the carp angler. When you get into the autumn months, and you start to get that drop in water temperatures. So now it's the 6th, I think, of October and the water temperatures will be getting down to about 13 degrees, which is a, a big drop. I mean, probably three weeks ago when we had some really strong, warm sunshine, they would have been five, six degrees higher than that. So in percentage terms, it's an enormous drop. And 
we're only three or four degrees away from dipping into single figures, which is when things really start to slow down a bit. So what does that mean in terms of the carp and what the carp are going to do? Well, carp are particularly older carp. An older carp usually means bigger carp, the ones we want to catch tend to be, and I'm noticing this more and more often in the autumns and in the springs, they are becoming more and more solar powered. Carp are solar powered anyway because they're cold blooded. But um, So whereas in the spring they will seek out areas of warmth, sunshine, not much wind to get their body temperatures up to what I call um, activated levels you know in preparation for spawning and so on it's all about keeping the, getting the body temperatures up to a an operational level in the autumn it's the opposite that's happening well the effect is the opposite but the end objective is the same for the fish so what i mean by that is that obviously the temperatures are falling away by day and by night we're in single figures at night now and the days are mid doubles <coughs> and the carp just wants one thing it wants to stay warm it wants to keep its body temperature up so you get a similar reaction to the spring in terms of the fish seeking out areas that are slightly warmer than other areas so less and less and less am i finding and this again is a a trend that i would see over the last few decades that's becoming more prevalent but isn't applicable to every water because there aren't really hard and fast rules, but this is a trend that I've definitely seen that come these, this time of year, the carp are not seeking out those deep, silty trenches on the end of a 25 mile an hour southwesterly with white tops rolling over that is really chilling the water down. So the reason, obviously, there, I mean, a lot of the carp are, are kind of like, Certainly the carp in this lake, they're like old ladies, you know, they're, they're 30, 40 years old, maybe more than that, some of them. And I don't think they want to be on the end of a strong wind getting their skirts blown over their heads. It's just too boisterous. They want to be under a heat lamp in the bingo hall, sitting somewhere quiet, you know. And I think, you know, funnily enough, I was talking to my very good friend Simon Scott about this this morning. And uh, he's in France at the moment. And he's finding exactly the same thing on a big lake in France, on the end of the wind where he's been fishing, all the small young stockfish, 35 acre pit, he's getting bites, nothing big, not seen anything big in the area. The other end of the pit, hundreds of yards away on the back of the wind, it's a new southwesterly, um, several hundred, hundred yards away on the back of the wind, the real big ones are getting caught. And it's the same here, it's the same on so many lakes that I've been going to over a long period of time that in the autumn they don't want to be on the end of those winds. As I said, there are always exceptions to the rule, but it's definitely a trend that I'm seeing. They will, here for example, I mean even, so here's one. So last, uh, last October, it was probably the third week of October and it had cooled down a lot. I was doing a lap of the lake trying to find some fish. Hard, as I said earlier, to find fish during the day in the autumn because they just don't, they just tend to disappear. Very hard to find. In the night, it's a different game, but during the day, it can be tricky. So I was doing a lap, and there was a, there's a swim in the corner of the lake, which is a noted summer warm weather area that they really like getting into. And I had a good look there in the summer regularly but this time third week of October I wasn't gonna it didn't even really occur to me to get up the tree and look into this shallow water which was all south facing and calm because I had all I'd fallen into the trap that everyone else had fallen into that no they'll be in the winter areas not the summer areas but as I walked around this bay I right I must have I somehow I clumsily spooked a fish. There was a, an eruption like 10 yards out. I was like, I froze, dropped down low, backed off, got behind a bush, put my Polaroids on, got up a tree, and they were all there. The whole stock, pretty much, two foot under the, sur foot under the surface, 
on quite a cool October day, you know, it's 12 degrees or something, but it was in a south facing corner getting, it was strong sunshine. Well, it was weak sunshine because it was October, but you know, it was clear blue sky and strongest sunshine for, for that time of year. And the cart were making it absolutely the most of those few degrees centigrade that they could get of sun. And you know, it was another lesson learned. I moved in, fished that area and caught that night really by pure luck you know and I chastised myself afterwards for being so quick to walk around that corner like everyone else had and think oh, I won't look in there you know it's a summer zone there's no such thing so bear in mind that in these months once you pass the equinox and so if you anyone that doesn't know what that is that means when your, your period of darkness is the same time as your period of daylight which is we're about 12 and 12 at the moment when you reach that, um, <clears throat> you will or you should be prepared to find fish in little sun traps on the back of the wind as well. And um, generally just making a bit, the most of the warmth exactly as they do in the spring. Younger, fitter maybe, smaller fish may be following the wind. So you could probably find fish on the end of the wind. But I'm talking really from a big carp um, application. Now, very often at this time of year, I will get messages on social media uh, to the line of, for example, now it's November or now it's October. Should I be fishing the deep, silty spots? Um, and I can never answer the question without knowing the lake because every lake is different and carp from lake to lake, lake to lake are different. I can think of lakes where right now being up the deep end in inverted commas, fishing in the silt perhaps, would work really well. But I can also think of other lakes where they tend to stay near to shallow ground throughout the whole autumn and indeed through the winter as well. So when it comes to location, there aren't any hard and fast rules. There are only guidelines. As we touched on in the summer section of these films, if you have an area of thick weed that isn't really dropping off in the autumn, then that would be a very, very, very good starting point indeed. Weed through any phase of the year, wherever the weed is thickest, is very often where the carp will be found as well. So the only way to be really sure you've got your location nailed on is by seeing what I call carp flesh. You know, so you want to see a fish of some description. But if it's flat calm, you may be able to find them by fizzing. You may be able to find them by watching the bird activity. We've done a, a video in this series on watercraft. So uh, I advise you to check that out. There's loads of tips and information in that on how to find carp at all times of year. I would say all things being equal on every lake I've ever been to, get to the lake in the late afternoon and spend all your energy into the evening finding out where they are and getting as close to them as you can and fishing for them with something that is not predictable, something that's a bit left of field. Now bait is, after location, is of course the area that we have to get right. There are no places for cutting corners when it comes to bait any time of year. And you can apply, you should apply that thinking to all areas, whether you've let your maggots get sweaty and out of condition or whether you're buying the cheapest boilies you can possibly get you know um, always remember if you cut corners with bait if that fish that you're after is not prepared to open its mouth it's all it has to do then you're not going to catch it when you put it in simplistic black and white terms like that it's quite a sobering thought yeah actually He's got to open his mouth, he's got to want it. And if it is not as good a quality bait as I could be offering, then the whole thing, the, the whole castle is built on sand, isn't it? The sort of bait that will work in the autumn is, and, and the sort of, and the way we bait is, is critical. Now, the majority of lakes that I've fished in the autumn over the last a long long time um, as you can see by my father Christmas beard um, I would say that 
by the time it gets to this time of year, the fish are usually not really switched on to boilies. They've been hammered on them all year, more often than not, and they're starting to get very, very wary of little round balls. So, faced with that, what do we do? They're, not only that, they're usually wary of big baited areas. And again, going back to the perfect storm that I mentioned earlier, you've got loads of natural food, fish that have been heavily pressured all year, fish that have probably done their quotient of captures. And just at that moment, you get all the anglers turning up with a gung-ho attitude, hey, it's autumn, let's give them loads of bait. And that is, what, that is how the perfect storm of rock-hard autumn fishing is created because people aren't fishing for a bite. They're, they're, they're of this mindset that we've almost been institutionalised into that it's autumn, it's the time to give them loads of bait. And these are the various combined factors that are causing precipitating carp fishing to be so difficult in the autumn now. Um, I can think of two waters that I fished in the last 10 years or so where boilies have really been the one through the autumn and into the winter months. But generally, something different is required. So, probably the most effective mix that I've found for the autumn months, if times have got hard and not, not much is being caught. And that's really important just to think about that to calibrate the fishing and how hard it is. If you turn up at the lake, there's various anglers around the lake. You talk to the bailiff, no one's really catching much. Nothing much has been caught for a couple of weeks, let's say, because it's autumn and it is rock hard. Do you really suppose that if you then go into a swim and put out your 30 spots of bait, that you're gonna be the one that's gonna catch when no one else is? takes a certain level of arrogance to think like that and the more arrogant or uh, the more the certain you are that your method is going to work when no one else's it clearly is not working then the more likely you are to fail it's far better to take a step back and think right there's probably some very good anglers on here no one's really catching if i go in and do what they're doing or go in heavy then i'm probably destined for failure as well instead what can I do to tip the balance in my favour? So in the past, I have found um, tiger nuts, chopped tigers mixed with casters, hemp, maybe a bit of boily crumb to be very, 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 very good. Um, usually without the boily crumb, actually, because I think if they're not I want to give them a completely different scent, col scent column to home in on that doesn't smell like the usual stuff. So for some reason, October, November is really, really good for casters, tiger nuts and hemp. as a, com a, a classic triple pronged combination of goodness. Uh, it's very, very hard to beat. I prepare my tigers at home. With, and if you look at the, the bait chapter, you'll be able to see how I do that. And buy my casters fresh from the tackle shop you know you don't need loads maybe something like a kilo of tigers five or six five four or five pints of casters and uh, a kilo of hemp or something like that will make a good mix because you don't need to be using lots and lots of quantity in fact that can be more often than not big quantity is counterproductive because by using lots of applying lots of bait you are creating a trap clearly obviously a baited trap it doesn't matter how good your bait is to a certain point the fish on most lakes will have been caught and exposed to and seen their mates caught on predictable baited traps all year so one of the biggest mistakes you can make is by going in and thinking right i'm going to put a bucket of bait there and put three rods on it and uh, and hope that that's going to work you're far better putting out maybe using a, a, a middle size spom and putting out six or seven of them six or seven handfuls you know keeping it modest when we were fishing at the quarry years ago the fishing in the autumn period was notoriously hard and the winters were quite tricky as well and 
as results tailed off and got harder and harder, I found the switch over to initially just straight tigers was absolutely key. With single tiger hook bait, again, getting away from the whole obsession that we have to jazz up a hook bait. Do we have to put cork in it? Do we have to put a yellow top? No, you don't. Just put a tiger nut on here. Same with my boily fishing. Just put a boily on here. Um, the less there is going on with things these days, the more of an advantage it will be to you because the carp won't associate it with any danger. So then it was a switch onto tigers, force bombs and a hook bait, you know, for a rod and the trap was set. And it went from, on, on that particular lake, it went from nothing being caught to me or my clients or me or my clients and sometimes all of us catching on every single trip and that was at a time when the quarry was day ticket and was permanently pretty much fully occupied nothing else was getting caught that's how radical that change was and ended up with with some of the biggest fish in the lake um gracing our nets which was which was quite incredible by which point as it evolved i found that adding the caster and, and i've always i've used casters an awful lot for the last 20 or more years actually um, and they are phenomenal and they complement tiger nuts so so well give you a little um another dimension i think that you know when you put hemp in there if you've got hemp tigers and casters you've got the th probably the three most acoustic baits that you could possibly have you know you imagine i remember when i was a boy laying on a tree trunk that went out over the lake and feeding chum mixes and the tree trunk actually laid on the water and you, you could lay on it almost getting wet and just drop chum mixes down and the fish would come up next to you and eat them these double figure commons and so on it's amazing and I always remember that these fish eating these chum mixes they, they would eat them and they would go down and they'd only be a foot or two away from me but you could hear them smashing these mixes in their throat teeth right next to you so if you've got a mix of hemp caster and tiger out there, that must be incredibly acoustically attra attractive to all fish in the area. A couple of carp crunching that, that's going to be really, really appealing to other fish around. So I think that's a, a, a key edge. But I think also the fact it's so innocuous as a mix. There's no flavours, there's no chemicals, there's, no, there's nothing predictable about it at all. So that's a very 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 good go-to winter approach now sorry autumn approach we've done a winter film right at the start of the series so have a look at that i think did we do a winter one Luke? Yeah, we yeah we did yeah so yeah so this is the last one of the series the autumn one so that's a very very good start for 10 but there are loads of other tactics that you could use it's all about looking at what the fish in your lake are exposed to and thinking well what could i do that no one's doing it might be a solid bag it might be a stringer it might be whatever but in this day and age carp fishing is very very stereotyped and very predictable and it's never been easier to find something different to what everybody else is doing and if you give the fish something that nobody else is doing and put it in the right spot then you'll invariably you'll catch them off guard and that is to your consummate advantage some lakes as i said over the years you know there have been a few that i've come across usually with older bigger fish they have shown a real preference for boilies maybe because they recognize the fact that everything is in these boilies that they they possibly could need i don't know but it shouldn't be ruled out now if your water has perhaps been a particle water dominated through the summer big patches of particle and, and corn and hemp and pellet and all that, and they haven't seen too many boilies, then switching to boilies in the autumn can absolutely be a leveller. But switching to it in a, a way that maybe other people aren't doing it. How many of you have cast out a couple of um, bottom bait rigs at fish? Or even better, not cast them at fish. Cast them 30 yards beyond the fish wound it in really quick on the surface till it gets where they are and lowering it down in amongst them no splash nothing you, you know it's like a stealth delivery by bait boat that so uh it's something that most of us have been doing for a long long time but it's still an edge today on on, on especially on pressured 
waters. But then having done that, baiting it with a catapult. A what? <laughs> you know, and just, you don't need to be wrapped up in um, spomming, <laughs> no pun intended, in spomming and, and doing all of that. Yes, that's an edge and a weapon if you're using tigers, hemp and casters, that's so how you need to get it in. But using a boilie and a catapult, or a catapult and boilies, um, and fishing bottom bait rigs with no jazzy fandango, right now is a big edge in carp fishing. Throwing sticks, again, they're making a bit of a resurgence. But um, if, if you can identify a loophole in your lake, i.e. everyone spawning, probably using particle and pellet and such like then you may well find that your fish will be very catchable through the winter months so uh, the autumn months and into the winter so i be last last uh, few winters now i've been using the forerunner the prototypes the test version and then finally the the market version of manila active you guys probably know my belief in bait and and how much i, I value the, the sticky range um, again we've done a whole chapter on bait so if you haven't seen that check that out but you couldn't have in my opinion a better boilie for fishing in small quantities in, in colder weather than manila active um, or krill active i mean i will continue using the krill usually till the end of november um, some waters you might identify the fish have a sweet tooth sometimes commons can go for a sweeter bait but anyway the active baits just dissolve with this halo of powders around them and milks and everything. And it just means that you just you, you need very, very few to create something that's not only eminently attractive, but it's totally visually different. Because when that paste melts down, it doesn't even look like a boilie laying on the bottom. You try getting one or two and dropping them in water, it's quite remarkable. So again, boilie fishing has got a big role to play. In, in certain waters in the autumn but again i would say keep the quantities lean don't fall into the mind trap of thinking that you need a ronnie rig and a stiff boom and a bright pop-up over the top because then you are just reverting back to square one which is where everyone else is and you will not be maximizing your potential in my opinion if you can just rein yourself in and forget all of the marketing brainwashing almost that's gone on into convincing everyone that their hook bait has to be going here i am i'm over here and actually it's just whispering quietly and seductively with natural signals it's a blended in color much more likely to trick a wary fish and um, probably an older fish because our younger fish are more sight orientated as feeders the older the fish get the more they use their olfactory senses of smell and taste if you've got a couple of fish in the area and one's young and sprightly and one big and old and you've got an obvious hook bait, you can bet that the young one will usually beat the, the old one to it. So you can tailor it to become a big fish tactic. Just take a boilie out of the bag, put it on the hair and cast it out. And if you're using a particularly soft bait like the uh, manilas or the krills tend to be, then just get a toughened hook bait, which most companies tend to make. So it comes down to successful autumn fishing comes down to being able to find the fish having that realization and acceptance that most of their activity is now nocturnal and if you're serious about finding them that's when you need to be doing most of your work it's about looking at how the fish have been pressurized throughout the calendar year what are people doing i want to know what people are doing i really do but not so that I can do what they're doing, it's so that I can do the exact opposite. Or maybe something that I can figure out that is very simple and basic and straightforward. It might be, so I went to another lake earlier in the year, so it's just a little example, right? So there was some margin fishing. It was a, a syndicate that I'm in down in Kent and I was walking around having a good look and I, I was able to find fish in these snags. And I fed them different bits of bait. This was in the summer. They showed no interest in anything. They were just laying up in the snags, totally uninterested. And I tried a lot of different things, different liquids and powders and concoctions. They, they wouldn't entertain it. They were just in one of their moods. They were sitting in the snags. But I knew where they were. So I thought, well, do you know what? I'm going to go down and fish there 
um, and I'll fish sort of in the in the area so that when they come out maybe at some point I might get one. When I went to the van to sort out my gear there was a tin of sweet corn in there which I always keep in a van and I thought and there was a little voice in my mind going take the corn take the fucking corn and, a, and another voice in my, my head was going they ain't going to eat corn mate you've just given them the best of the best options and they're not interested in eating but the voice that was going take the corn was the one that I eventually heeded and I picked it up put it on the barra went down to the swim you can guess what's going to happen went into the back of this snag oh I, I parked the barrow and there's this voice is back in me going put a bit in put it. so does anyone else get voices in their head or is it just me probably just me so uh top this got this corn I tipped a bit in my hand just a palmful gone in the back of the snag and I put this corn down gnarly old highly pressured fish it was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. They were like iron filings to a magnet. In, in seconds, they had obliterated it. They came straight in on it and smashed it. And then they, they got so motivated, they came out of the snag and started swimming around and digging up the bomb. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. But it just goes to show you that sometimes it's the thing you least expect, but there is always something that will really, really press the button of the carp and if you can find those things and very often they're simple they're just something that the fish hasn't seen or been exposed to before and they can be gold dust so you will only find those things by thinking outside the box look, looking outside the box if you follow people uh, follow trends if you're obsessed with whoever it is on your lake who's catching the most fish and you're just focused on them, oh, I wish I knew what he was doing. Oh, there he is again. What's he doing? What's, oh, I wish I could see in his bucket. Forget all that. You will never catch a fraction of whoever that is just by following him. Think of finding your own ways and focus on your own fishing and work at that and then your results will improve. If you're trying to follow someone, then you'll, you'll never quite get there. So try and carve your own niche. Believe me, it's so much more satisfying when you find the fish yourself, when you find a clear spot yourself, when you come up with something that is a, a weakness in their armour. Keep your mind open. Don't be slavish to trends. It's one of the biggest bits of advice I can give you. Um, don't be predictable. Don't be slavish to trends. And hopefully you'll be able to make the most of what is, as I said right at the beginning, one of the hardest parts of the whole flipping year, the autumn one of the greatest times to be out because there's no mosquitoes but you know it's hard and it will punish people and and again just going back to to give you another example this is an interesting one actually i just want to throw this in so sandhurst five four or five years ago i was fishing there a bit sandhurst one of the most pressured big fish circuit waters in the country incredible stock of fish beautiful lake um but the fish are under sustained pressure, which makes them hard to catch at any time of year, other than their mad half hours, which you see on Facebook or on, where, on wherever, and you think, oh, it's quite easy down there. And then you realize actually the rod hours from the cumulative rod hours from all the anglers in between that you don't hear about. You only hear about when the fish have just had a mad half hour and feed hard enough to get caught. What do you do when you're at those times where the fish aren't feeding hard enough to get caught, where they're being little SOBs and they're you know the shutters are down um, and I remember stumbling on um, a, a little concoction of naturals that um, worked really well up there and um, a few casters a few tigers that, that I mentioned earlier and I went and did some film and used this mix um, the lake was booked every peg was taken and I won't bore you with the figures but other than one, all of the fish got caught were to me. Now I'm thinking, I went away from that thinking, hmm, now I know I'm not that good. So I'm thinking, hmm, something special and unique has happened here. Why has it been so? So then I started thinking about the whole application, the quantities, the type of hook bait that was subtle. Um, and I thought, right, do you know what? I'm going to go back and do it again without the cameras because that was a filming trip for Sticky, which is, uh, again, that's available to find Sandhurst Session or something it's called. I thought I'm going to go back and do it again just to prove to myself that actually I had found something. Went back again, fished the same way in a different part of the lake where I'd found them and caught four more in two nights. But the really interesting thing about that 
is that Sandhurst was pretty much fully booked. Every weekend was an exclusive. During the week, four fifths of the swims would be taken. Really busy. And during a period of six weeks, other than the fish I caught on those two trips, only two other carp got caught. And fascinatingly, they were both caught by local lads who were harvesting water snails from under the rocks in the edge and out the reeds, pulling up the stems and getting the, and fishing those, put, smashing a few up and putting them in it, drying them off the ground bait, putting them in bag, couple on the hair, that sort of thing. And they caught two. And there was the fish that I caught, which totaled, I don't know, maybe 10 or something, but they were on naturals as well. Now, you think about Sandhurst in a, a six week period where almost every swim is taken almost all the time. And you think how many times those fish were exposed during that period to a stiff inge or a Ronnie and none of them got picked up. Literally nothing got caught on, on a straightforward run of the mill predictable tactic. They, nothing, no one caught anything. And that to me is still to this day the greatest uh, example of just how switched off carp can be at times and yet that they can be catchable if you're prepared to step off the track that the flock are on, step away, don't be part of the herd, do your own thing, think about your angling and try and force a result by doing something different. It's the cornerstone of all my fishing and as I was saying you know there's no more satisfying a carp in your arms than one that you've caught yourself we all want shortcuts and easy things in life but if you could just walk into a swim and go oh john i'm on point how many wraps to yeah thanks mate and what was it a pink run it yeah okay yeah you might catch a carp probably won't certainly at this time of year because <laughs> it's so hard but it's nothing like the buzz that you would get from salt in some sweet corn so it will go in a bag and put in eight grains in a little mesh bag and having one grain of, of maize on the hair and putting it where and you know the buzz you get from doing it your own way is phenomenal so keep your eyes and ears open it's autumn there are big carp out there waiting to be caught be on your game in the evenings if you're really serious about things think about your bait application and hopefully you'll be able to squeeze a few extra captures out of this, the back end of the season that wouldn't have otherwise have come your way. Really hope you've enjoyed this series. I'm gonna wrap it up now. My voice is just starting to dry up on me. I'm gonna get myself packed up and get home. Um, I've, I fished last night, caught an incredible carp this morning by doing exactly what I've been just advocating to you guys. Fishing my dreams actually. So I'm gonna go home and dream about that. And in the meantime, thanks very, very much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed the series and um, look out for more material because me and my buddy Luke behind the camera, the genius behind the lens, will be out doing more stuff, in session stuff uh, and so on that will be coming up with, with the series as we move forward. But this is the last instalment in our seasonal um, view of things. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you have put it can put it to some use or have put the other seasons to good use. Caught yourself some fish, got you thinking hopefully, and hopefully you've enjoyed watching. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you again soon.